Well, today I want to talk about, get us started on the whole aspect of discipleship. And what does God say in his word about this? There's lots that he says. But I want to start off by asking you a question. What is your identity? There's a song that uh, was used for CSI, but it's actually a song by the Who. It says, who are you? Who are you? And sometimes you may wonder that about yourself. Uh, Actually, there's some commercials on TV these days about people stealing your identity. And they kind of make a joke out of it, but it's not funny. But the one I like is the guy on the moose. If you've seen it, he's got a Canadian flag in one hand and the maple syrup jug in the other hand. And he has no idea that he's a Canadian by the way he's talking. For example, he says that he's on something called an antler cow. He says, I'm holding a hockey stick. He actually, what he calls it is a skatey punchy. Rather appropriate. And in the other hand, where he's holding the maple syrup, he calls it tree juice. And I tell you, that is so non-Canadian. And then he takes out an a, a, a envelope that he's taken from somebody, and, and he says where he's from, and he can't say Manitoba, and he's trying to do it. And so, but the, the, the point is, our identity gets stolen. And there's so much out there about changing your passwords. Don't tell anybody your password. You ever notice when people do PIN, how they, they cloak it? They try to. And now tap is a lot quicker, then there's no PIN involved. But, but this whole thing of identity stealing. Like, I had a call from someone on the phone, sound very official, from Canada Revenue and the Revenue Agency. <laughs> Did some of you have the same guy call you or woman? <laughs> They've been busy. And I'm listening to this, and it's very serious, and the guy's going on, and I'm thinking, what? And then he finally says, now, if you give us your visa number, we will quickly take this off. So since you owe us 15000 which I didn't, I knew that much, and they said, if you were willing to send us $5,000, we will forget it all. I thought, this is a new day for our government. <laughs> wow. They're operating in forgiveness. And... Uh, so after a while, I figured out what was going on, and, and then I said, I want to talk to your manager. No, you don't need to talk to your manager. And I said, yes, I want to talk to your manager. So somebody else gets on and starts the same spiel. And I said, I, said, I need you to uh, confirm this by an email to me, and then click. And I called uh, the gentleman who does our accounting. He says, oh, Rob, did you fall for that? I said, no, I didn't fall for it. I was just dragging them along. He says, you have to call the police. I said, what are they going to do at that point? So how many of you have had that call? Oh, my goodness. Let's get our taxes in order, folks. Come on. Um, Well, they're always trying. Now, how many of you grew up in a small town? Quite a few of you. Some of you from the city. Okay. You're more anonymous in the city than you are in a small town. The smaller the town, the more the people know everything about you. Isn't that true? They know more about you before you even know what's happened. And... uh, so I grew up, in, as you know, in a little town called Wheatley. At the time, it was uh, 1,200 people, 1,200 people in that whole town, a uh, fishing town. And uh, uh, when you have three brothers, there's four of us, four boys, they knew we were the Gulliver boys. That's why we went by the Gulliver boys. And, uh, and so, so many a time I'd be doing something, and somebody would say, aren't you, that my mom and dad, aren't you Pete and Jerry's boy, one of, his, one of their boys? And since our names all started with R, they could never keep us straight. As a matter of fact, my dad couldn't keep us straight sometimes. But that was their choice. They did that. And, um, and I would think, well, before I answer from one of the Gulliver boys, they're either asking for two questions. One is, they're actually curious who I am. Or secondly, I'm in trouble and they're calling my parents. Because in those days, that's what happened. If I got in trouble at somebody's place, by the time I got home, my parents knew about it. And then I got in trouble again. So uh, I know that doesn't happen now, except at our house. And uh, maybe it happens in your house, and we try to deal with stuff. But you know, when you're growing up in a small town, you have a clear identity of who you are. I thought it was so clear. How many of you have had a police check? You know, you have to have a police check to do a lot of things these days, correct? Now, I'm not going to ask you if you had a police check because you did something wrong. (laughs) Just a police check. So I went in for my police check. And, uh, you know, you fill out the forms, you do all this stuff, I think it's 25 bucks, and away you go. But the problem was, they flagged my name. And they took me aside. And they said, we have to send information about you to the RCMP. And I said, why? And they said, we can't tell you. (laughs) 
I said, and they said, come back here. And I had to go to this back room, and I had to be fingerprinted. Welcome back, Chester. Good to see you, brother. Next week, are you ready to share? Okay, good. That's a non-complacent answer. Um, I'll talk to you. Uh, so I had to go, and they do the fingerprint thing. You know, they do it in the ink, and they roll it. They did the whole thing. I said, do I need to do this? <laughs> and the, the officer lady said, what? <laughs> so anyway, so they did it all, and then I, then I finally said, look, I just came in for a police check. Why am I doing all this? And she said, your name was flagged because there's something about your name that's similar to somebody who's in trouble with the law. I said, well, I have three, three brothers. Um, <laughs> and she said, no, probably not. But anyway, it was all cleared. Everything's good. So now I have to go do another police check, uh, probably this week or next. And uh, if you see ink on my fingers, you'll know why. I'll just give you a heads up. If you see ink on my finger, you'll say, oh, Pastor Rob went to God police check. And if you see me standing weird, they took my picture as well. But you know something? Uh, God knows your identity. I want you to turn, if you have it, a uh, psalm. It's not on the PowerPoint. Psalm 139 uh, is a great psalm. And God has a clear understanding of our identity. And we're going to look at that. Psalm 139, I want to read verses 1 to 6, and then 13 to 16. So, uh, Psalm of David. 139, verses 1 to 6, and 13 to 16. I'm reading from the New International Version, but it says, get the drift. Now, this is what David is saying, okay? Verse 1 of Psalm 139. He says, O Lord, you have searched me, and you, if you have it there, says what? You, you know me. You know me. And then he says, if that's not, you know when I sit down, when I get up, you perceive my thoughts from afar, you discern where I'm going, where I lie down. You're familiar with all my ways. As a matter of fact, he says, before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You hem me in behind and before. You've laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful me for me, too lofty for me to attain. In other words, he's saying there is a strong, intimate relationship here. God, you know everything about me. Then let's look at verses 13. Because he explains a bit more in this psalm. He says, verse 13, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Who knit him together? God. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. David has this understanding of relationship, of identity. The message tells us in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26, the first part of verse 26, God spoke and he said, let us make human beings in our image, make them reflecting our nature. And in verse 27, God created human beings. He created them godlike. Reflecting God's nature, he created them male and female. Now, when I go about doing things, you know something? We have a lot of different identities. What do I mean by that? Well, there's the, there's the one, if you, if you take out your wallet, you have something, some of you have something called a driver's license. Okay, you can use that for identification, correct? Right? Uh, can you use your OHIP card for that? No. No, those are cheater cards. You can't use those. Right? So, so, you know, I have those documentations that have my legal name on it, and that's what they're after. I have an uh, ID of certain generation, a baby boomer. They call me a baby boomer because I play the drums. You know, a baby boomer. Um, how many of you are in the generation of the baby boomers? Okay, millennials. You don't even know what I'm talking about? Pastor Wayne is a millennial. Oh, I want to say something. It's being filmed. Um, I have personal ID and a bank card. That's where I have my, you know, you're supposed to have your pin and all that stuff. The government seems to know a lot about us, all our documentation. And there's another one that you should have, and that's the reflective nature of God. 
Our identity is our reflective nature of God, as it says in Genesis. And I thought, even with all these truths and realities, we struggle as followers, as a disciple of Christ, to find our true identity. We can really struggle with this. Now, why do I say that? Well, I've been reading a number of books for uh, quite a few weeks on discipleship. I've been online looking up some stuff, spent a lot of time reading the Word about the disciples and that. And one of the books that I've been enjoying in particular is by Greg Ogden on this. And I came across a quote in there that I want to share with you that really brings us home. He says, as I look at the Christian community through the lens of my pastoral leadership, 35 years, I saw so many people who said they were Christians, but were not defined by that label. Many of these people had made a profession of faith in Christ that was meaningful to them. Now, here's the kicker. But being a disciple of Jesus was not their true identity. And that's what I want us to understand today. What is our true identity? Is it our passport? Is it our driver's license? Is it you're a Gulliver boy? Is it a boomer general? What is your true identity? So I want to ask you a question. Should I read this statement and be bothered by it? Yes or no? Yes. We should be bothered by it because it's true. It's the battlefield. And then I started thinking about this. I thought, okay, yeah, that, that last sentence bothers me. Does it apply to you or me? It might. And how can I say I'm a follower of Christ with so many other people who say they are, and yet we struggle to have a true identity in Jesus? Our true identity. So let's, let's go back. Let's, let's picture the time when Jesus was on this earth. All right, so if we turned up the heat in here, we'd have a better understanding. If I had a bottle of water and I squirted it, I could say, here's the Sea of Galilee. We could throw a few dead fish and, you know, we'd kind of set the atmosphere. We didn't want to do any of that because that's not a whole lot of fun. And besides, we're not at a, a ride, you know. We're here to say, what did Jesus do when he walked that beach? Why did he do what he did? And the story unfolds for us in such a way that it leads us to see how the Gospels were formed and also the book of Acts when it comes to the disciples, the people who had true identity with Jesus. And why do they look different than some of us today? Why is that? And Jesus understands you because you and I are knit together. He knows you. He knows your fingerprints because all of us have different ones, correct? Correct. Did you know that every single snowflake is different? Now, who spends the time figuring that out? You know, by the time you catch it, it melts. There's a, oh, that's a, that, there's a, oh. I think this one is, oh, different, oh. But you and I have an identity that is you. And Jesus knows this. But the thing that you and I struggle with is the word that Judy, Judy, that the Lord gave you, is calling out the next steps of that identity what he has called us to do. And so Jesus is walking along a beach, we know this, in Matthew 4, 18 to 22. And he sees men fishing. And it wasn't just uh, the sons of Zebedee and Peter and Andrew. It wasn't just those guys. There would have been lots of people fishing. So we can't think there was just two boats or two families or, or that was it. No, there would have been lots of people fishing because that's what they did at that point in the Sea of Galilee. And he's walking along there, and what does he say? He sees, he sees firstly, he, he runs into these two guys that we get to know a little bit along the way, and th that is John. And John is one of the ones, he's a fisherman, and his brother, who's his brother? James. So John and James, sons of Zebedee, and he says to them, what? Come, follow me. Come, follow me. Now, think about Jesus. All we know is he dressed very plainly. He was not dressed in any way like a Levi or a priest or a rabbi. He was not dressed in a way that you would identify him immediately as one of those who could call people. Besides, they wouldn't call fishermen anyway. They hadn't gone through all the steps of the training to understand the Talmud, to understand all the different things they need to understand. They, did, they weren't there. They were fishermen. Not that they didn't memorize the Torah, not that they didn't know some of those things, obviously, but they were fishermen, period. That's what their lot in life was. That's all they would do for their whole lives was fish. And Jesus comes along and he says to them, follow me. And the scripture tells us that immediately they left their nets 
and their boats, and they follow Jesus. And we go, wow, these guys are amazing. They are superheroes. I should have a shirt with those guys leaving their nets and walking away, like following Jesus. No, not quite. Not quite, because Jesus knows us. And it tells us this as well, and about, there was a tax collector. How many of you like tax collectors? Come on. A genuine tax collector, not the phony ones. When you owe money at that time of year, and you have to pay your taxes, and you don't want them in arrears, right? And Levi was a tax collector. So fishermen we can tolerate, tax collectors maybe not. Fishermen we can tolerate, tax collectors I don't know, but Jesus calls Levi. And then in Luke 6, 12 to 16, we see all of these people, because there were more than the 12, there was a large group following Jesus, and it says one day, and he had been ministering all day, and then it says one day soon afterwards, Jesus went to a mountain to pray, very typical of Jesus. And he prayed to God all night, all night long, he prayed. And at daybreak, he called together all of those people who were disciples. In other words, they were following him. They were called disciples. And out of those, he chose 12. And he changed the name to apostles. Now, apostle literally means like missionary, someone who will go out. And so he called them apostles who would establish things. And he says, here are the names. Simon, also called Peter, Andrew, Peter's brother, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Alphaeus, sorry, Simon the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who later betrayed him. Jesus prayed all night long for who should be the 12, and he heard from the Father, and he went and picked them out, handpicked. Did he know them? Did he know them? Yes? Yeah, he knew who they were. He knew who they were. He knew more about them than they knew about themselves. And the interesting thing is, by the way, when you go through that list, did you see Levi in there? Did you notice? Was Levi in that group? No, he wasn't. Levi was not in the 12. I found that very fascinating. I went on a couple of things to check that out, and it didn't, he didn't show up. He was there in the group, but out of the 12... But he was still picked by Jesus. Now, that is very significant because you say, well, you know, I'm not up there doing that, pastor. I can't do this. I can't do the Sunday school. But are you still called by Jesus? Are you still handpicked by Jesus? Yes. Because he knows what he wants you to do and what for me to do. And there were many others there. And I thought, well, were these guys the cream of the crop, Jesus? Were these the very best? Were these the rising stars? Were they the, the picture perfect, flawless ones? No, they were not. Just like I am not and you are not. There's no way because we have all kinds of issues in our lives that Jesus wants to heal. Now, these guys failed. They had a lack of faith. He said, all you need is the faith of a what? And you can say to that mountain and be removed. Now, why did he say that? Because they were trying to deal with a demonic and they couldn't deal with a demonic. And Jesus came to them and basically rebuked them about their faith. And that's not the only time he said that. There were other times where he came after them about their faith. He, there was a time when they came to him, they said, we don't know how to pray. Do you ever get in that position yourself? You don't know how to pray about something? I don't know how to pray about this. They lost sight of the mission. Oh, boy. Folks, as Christians, do we lose sight of the mission? What God has called us to. It's exciting when you come to Jesus. Amen? Oh, come on, church. Wake up. It's exciting when you come to Jesus. You're set free. You have eternal life. You belong to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's given you the keys of the kingdom, the power of the Holy Spirit. He's given you everything. Hallelujah. We have something that nobody else has. It's called woo, Jesus. His name is Jesus. But you know something? You say, well, when is eternity for me? When, when will my life end? Well, none of us know. Doris didn't know. A pastor, Pastor Don's uh, Sharon. Sharon is in Toledo because her only aunt passed away. They didn't know. Jay Calder's mom passed away, fighting cancer for a long time. You don't know. So the thing is, once you come to Christ and it's all exciting and wonderful and you get set free and you, Jesus is your Savior and you start walking that path, but it could be a long road. And the longer you walk with Jesus, you shouldn't be losing, you should be gaining. 
You shouldn't be falling away. You should be rising up. You shouldn't be sitting back. You should be standing up. You shouldn't be quiet. You should speak out because that's who we are. That's our identity. And so these disciples are following Jesus, and there's times they just forgot the mission. What am I supposed to be doing? This is a long journey. This is hard to do. And they lost sight of the mission. They forgot who they were with. They were with Jesus. They misunderstood the times. When will this all happen, Jesus? When will these walls come down? When is all this going to happen? We don't understand the times in which we live. They denied him. They forsook him. They deserted him in his darkest hour. And on and on and on. These are these 12. (laughs) They did great things, but boy, oh boy, I can see myself all over the map. And I thought, do we really believe Christ chose these 12? As a matter of fact, John 15, 16 says, you, speaking of me, speaking of those disciples, you did not choose me, but I chose you. I chose you. You said, oh, I came to Christ. Well, actually, he was coming after you all along. He wanted you all along. If you're sitting here and you don't know Jesus, he wants you. He already knows you. He's waiting for you to say yes to him. He says, I chose you. With all my warts, Lord, yeah. All my flaws, yeah. All my failures, oh, yeah. Are you aware of all those? Mm-hmm. You still going to have me? Oh, yeah. Doesn't matter what tribe, what tongue, what nation. I want you to be a disciple, and your identity is in me. That's the calling he has on us. That's what he says to us. And thankfully, he's still choosing people. Right now, as we are here, there are people coming to Christ in Islam, in Muslim countries, Hindus, Buddhists, atheists, agnostics, religious people are coming to Christ right now as we're standing here. Hallelujah. There is a constant party in heaven. If you think heaven's going to be, oh, it's in the sweet by and by, boy, I've got news for you. Man, oh man, streets of gold. Hallelujah. When was the last time you walked on a street of gold? When was the last time you saw angels flying around? When was the last time you saw hordes of thousands in the robes of righteousness praising the king of kings? When did you see that last? Oh, I tell you, when we get to heaven, hallelujah, we're going to have a time. We'll fall down before the king, but then he'll pick us up and he'll say, come on, join the party. Because every time somebody comes to Christ, the, the Bible says there's a party in heaven. There's a hallelujah time going on up there. I want to tell you, when I got saved, that's what they did. I got saved on the weekend, and by Sunday night, they threw a hallelujah party for me at our house, and I had no idea what they were doing. I was waiting to get high, do a joint, and do some drinking, but God had set me free from that stuff in, in two days. In two days. And we had a hallelujah party. And I said, do we play bingo? What do we do? Because <laughs> Christians are boring. That's what I thought. But boy, I've met some crazy Christians. I'll tell you. And Judy, you're one of them, I'll tell you. (laughs) You know how I met Judy? When we were going to pray through the house over there. At the farm. And somebody said, you got to wait for these ladies to come and pray through the house at the farm. So, So Wayne, you were over there. Wayne Cable and I, we were putting in all electrical plugs, remember? At the old farmhouse. Which the tilts, where are the tilts? Are they here? I'll call them where they should be here. And uh, no, we were doing that at their house. Kidding. And we were doing their house. Anyway, so, so I said to, to Wayne Cable, I said, thanks for all your help. I got to wait for these ladies. They're coming soon to pray before I go back to Listwell. And I waited and I waited and I waited and it got later and later and later. And I'm thinking, are these ladies ever going to come? And they come in. All I can hear is laughter. Judy. And I'm thinking, oh, they must be here. And they're all hackling and laughing and carrying on. And they said, oh, hey, pastor, you know, doing all this stuff. I'm thinking, who are these ladies? And I said, well, what are you here for? And they said, we're here to pray through the house. I said, okay. And it was like 9.30 at night or something. And they're supposed to be there, what, at 7? And I'm thinking, okay, I know what it's like when you get praying through a house. It takes a long time, especially with, sorry, four ladies. And uh, (laughs) these four ladies. But it was awesome. We prayed. I don't know what time I got out of there. But, boy, did we pray. And that's where I met Judy. And I thought, Lord, thank you for the kingdom of God has got every flavor you can imagine. And that's not a bad thing. Isn't that great? If we were all the same, how boring would that be? Right? But we're not. And so thank you, Judy, for being Judy. Amen? And uh, all the rest of you, thank you for being who you are in Christ. And so Jesus calls us, 
And, and he says, walk with me. And I want to end with this because we know the story that Peter was the one who was very close on that inner circle. There was John, James, and Peter. They were like the closest ones when Jesus had the Mount of Transfiguration and all these different things. Peter was right there with him. And Peter was the one. Jesus said, you're going to deny me three times. And, and Peter did, right? And so then we see this Peter going and he's wept. He's weeping. He's just, he's repenting. He must have been tore. I don't know how he survived until Jesus was resurrected and they met him. But the day comes, you see, we think of these guys now, because they say they left their boats and their nets, we think they never went back to that. Well, I want to tell you, if you jump into John 21, 15 to 17, we see the story unfolding where they're back fishing. You see, the thing is, folks, when you commit your life to Christ and that's your identity, don't go back to the old ways. Don't go back to the old things. They'll drag you down. They'll stop you from growing. Whatever that might be. And if you need to get set free from whatever that thing is, get set free so you can go on the journey with Jesus. And you press in. And here's Peter back fishing. And the story is told where Jesus is on the beach. It's early morning. These guys have been fishing. They're not catching anything. And he hollers out and he tells them to throw their nets in just like he did one other time. And uh, we've been fishing all night. Da, da, da. They threw the nets in. And they had so many fish. It actually tells us in Scripture how many they caught. hundred and. 56 or something, I don't know the number, but there was a huge number, and they caught all these fish, and these guys are trying to pull the nets, and what does Peter do when they recognize Jesus? He doesn't help them. He takes off his outer robe, and he jumps in the water, and he swims towards Jesus. Now, when was the last time you ran to Jesus and just said, Jesus, forgive me for my sins. Cleanse my heart. I want to be right with you. And that's Peter. And he just, just this bold guy, and he gets out of the, you know, I'm sure when he got on the beach, it's like, now what do I do? You know, like God, God will call us into stuff, and we stand there going, now what do I do? And so we see the story unfolding where they're on the beach, they're having the fish, and these words come. And, I, and I'm going to read it to you in John, because it's how it's said that makes it important. It says, when they had finished eating, in John 21, verse 15, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, Simon. Son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Now, I want you to stop right here. Have you ever contemplated these? Love you more than these? And I was praying about this one day, and I said, Lord, give me insight into this story. Help me to really understand what happened here, because this is so crucial to what happens to this man in Acts, because if this didn't happen, he couldn't have done what he did in Acts. You see, you can't move on with God unless you process forgiveness and repentance. And then when you do, you're set free to do what God's called you to do. And here's Peter, and, he's, and, I, and I can just picture Jesus saying, do you, do you love me more than these? And I'm sure he's pointing at the fish. Do you love me more than, than these fish? Do you love me more than, than pornography? Or bitterness? Or unforgiveness? Or ain't? What, what do you love what are you involved in more than me, Peter? And he says, well, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Now, when Jesus asks this, he says, do you truly love? Truly love is agape. That's that unconditional love. Do you truly unconditionally, Peter, love me? And Peter doesn't answer with that. He answers with, I have filio or brotherly love for you, Jesus. And Jesus says, feed my lambs. Again, he said, Simon, son of John, do you truly agape me? Do you truly unconditionally love me? He answers, yes, Lord. You know that I filio, brotherly, love you. Hmm. He's still not getting it. Again, we see the same thing. The third time, as he said, take care of my sheep. He's the third time he says, Simon, son of John, do you filio me? So he changes it from agape because He's not answering to that. He says, do you filio me? And it says this, Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him the third time, do you filio, do you love me? And he says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I have this brotherly relationship with you. And that's what we have with Jesus. But I want to tell you, he wants us to have a gape relationship with him because he loves us unconditionally and he wants us to love him unconditionally. We put conditions before you. If, if I prayed and prayed for this and it didn't happen, I prayed and prayed for that and it didn't. These are conditions. I prayed and prayed for this and it didn't take place. So therefore, I'm wondering about the power of God. Is God real? Is God hearing me? Is God going to move on this? I prayed and prayed and prayed and this didn't happen. These are the conditions. 
He wants us to love him unconditionally. And I want to tell you more than my name and my passport and my driver's license and my old hip card and my SIN and my marriage certificate, more than all these combined, I am to love him because that is my identity. For all my todays and tomorrows, the question is, is it your true identity? Is it your true identity? And so I want us to begin to see this. Take out your bulletin because we're ending now. Everybody should have had one or at least share with someone. Because being a disciple of Christ as the worship team comes is our true identity. And it's on the, uh, on the uh, PowerPoint as well that you can see what we're talking about. Do you have it? So every week, and I hope next week we'll have it online as well. I didn't uh, get around to it this time around. My apologies, but you do have it here. Um, being a disciple, our true identity. So there's an introduction, and you can see that for yourself, and we kind of introduce it. Let's go to the next PowerPoint, please. And then here's some questions. For example, how would you define your own personal journey as a disciple of Christ? Is your true identity in him? If so, how do you know this, and if not the same? This is, this is something you do. Don't rush at this. Take it home. Um, Mono's already got us doing a 20-minute survey. <laughs> Thanks, Mono. Thanks, team. Now, it's very important to do that survey. But I want you to get started on this because this is a personal journey. Now, how many of you already, don't put your hand up, but imagine how many of you have types of devotions, right? You do devotions, different kinds. You do, you know, there's all kinds of stuff out there. That's great. But I'm challenging you to take this one on because as we go forward in the area of discipleship, we need to grow together. So even if you miss a service, you can still get this information. We'll have it online. You can go back. You can watch these. You can listen, and you can follow along. Read what the disciple then he should look like in John 15. Read through all of John 15, chapter uh, 15 of John, and you will see so many things there about what a true disciple should look like. What is our identity in Christ? Uh, the uh, questions 3 and 4 talks about Hebrews 12, and this is about who, is in f who has touched your life in the journey. And finally, action steps. These are the action steps. What are you going to do? So this is for you to take home. Uh, spend some time praying, working on it. Don't feel guilty if you don't get it done. Um, there will be a fee if you don't. But other than that, it's good. No. It's really important. Why do we need to do this, church? Because we're to grow, right? And if I'm going to be a disciple with my true identity in Christ, then I need to lay some things down and take up my cross and follow him how often? every day. Let's stand. Heavenly Father, you are so good. You are a good, good Father. And you love us and you know us. We're knit together by your hand. Who can fathom such things? David said this knowledge is too much. <laughs> I don't know how to deal with it. And yet he understood in relationship that his identity was with you. And I want you to stop for a minute and think and ask yourself a tough question. Is my true identity in Jesus? Or is it in other things? My job, my skill set, my accomplishments. People know me on the street or at work. What is my true identity? As the worship team leads us, we're just going to ponder that question for a few moments. And then we're going to pray. So Holy Spirit, speak into our hearts as we ask that question. Because it'll either be yes or no. And if it's a no, then Lord, we ask you to reveal what the hindrances are that are affecting my identity in Christ as my true identity. So as Doug leads us, let's think about that. Let Spirit speak. I heard it broken in Overwhelmed by the weight of sin Jesus is called
now, Lord, we've asked the question. And your people know your voice. And so if the Lord has spoken to you in this area and the sense is, you know what, that's not my true identity. I want you to know you're not alone. Remember what I read right at the first? Meaningful experience with Christ, but there's something missing. Still not true identity. That's what this journey is going to be about. But we need to start right here today at this altar. If you ask the Lord and he said no, then I want you to come and spend time here with me. And this is not, this is not bad. This is not wrong. It's just a reality check of where we're at and where he wants to take us. So if your answer to that was, is my true identity really in him? If that was in your sense in your heart and you know that, that it's no, then, then I want you to come. Just come to this altar right now. And again, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. We all come the same. If that's you, don't be shy. Who'd be the first to take that step? Church. 